This is Bob Oliphant from the Westford Historical Society and Museum bringing you Episode 7 of Season 2 of the Westford Wardsman Podcast. The Westford Wardsman newspaper was part of Turner's Public Spirit, a weekly newspaper in air a century ago. In this episode, we'll be reading the Wardsman for the week ending Saturday, February 13, 1909. I'll elaborate on what was happening in Westford 114 years ago as we read. Uh, The February 13th issue begins with the Westford Center section. This is the second session that Miss Ethel Fowl, F-O-W-L-E, of Woburn, dancing teacher, has conducted classes in dancing at at the town hall. Friday evening last week, Miss Fowle gave a ball for her class, which was one of the pleasant events of the season's social calendar. Many interested parents and friends were present, and the pupils showed the good results of the instruction of their youthful teacher, going through their dances with much grace and precision. The Grange Orchestra furnished music for the occasion, and refreshments were served in the lower hall. Mr. and Mrs. Edward Fisher are the happy parents of a little daughter, Esther, uh, it doesn't say it here, but her name was Esther G. Fisher, born Thursday, February 4th, and Edward Fisher was the town clerk at the time. There was a large congregation present at the Congregational Church on Sunday morning. The pastor gave a well-prepared and interesting discourse on Abraham Lincoln. In the evening at the Christian Endeavor Services, John P. Wright, the president, led the meeting. It was the anniversary of the formation of the First Society in Portland, Maine, nearly three decades ago. It was roll call evening and re- and in response to their names, many of the older ones gave interesting reminiscences of those early days of the movement, both in the local society and as a whole, those early days of a great and popular organization with its enthusiasm and zeal and influence for good on the lives of those associated with it. Charles O. Prescott was the guest the first of the week of our former teacher at the academy, William A. Perkins, at his home in Grafton. At a meeting of the library club in that place, Mr. Prescott read his paper on New Zealand, which was so much enjoyed by the members of the Tadmont Club a season ago. The annual dance given by Edward M. Abbott Hose Company No. 1 will take place in Town Hall, Westford, Monday evening, February 22nd. Music by Kittredge's Orchestra. The next section is, section is the Grange. Various other attractions the same evening affected the attendance at the regular Grange meeting somewhat last week, Thursday evening. However, an attendance of about 60 enjoyed a good session. At the business session, Mrs. F.C. Wright, chairman, and the dinner committee f- for the Farmers Institute the preceding week gave a report showing the net proceeds for the Grange Treasury to be $45.05. A rising vote of thanks was given the ladies' degree staff who worked so hard to make this dinner a success. The lecturer had given the evening's program in charge of some of the younger members, and the following numbers were given with encores. Piano solo, Mrs. C.A. Reed. Song, Mrs. John McIntosh. Song, John Grieg. Cornet solo, Arthur Blodgett. Uh, The next section is called Food Sale. The food sale under the auspices of the WCTU Women's Christian Temperance Union, at the pleasant home of Mrs. E. J. Whitney on Tuesday afternoon, proved very much of a success in every way. I believe that Mrs. Whitney's maiden name was uh, Leland in that she and her husband lived in the old uh, Leland house right at the point where Leland uh, Road comes into Main Street. Those who had the fare in charge felt amply repaid for the work put into it. The sale commenced at the noon hour to accommodate the academy students, and they availed themselves of the chance to purchase. So the academy students would have been at what is now Roden uh, Community Center now, so that was a short walk from there to the, the Whitney House. Cookies, donuts, corn balls, pickles, etc. found ready sale. The sale continued later in the afternoon and was well patronized, and the good home-cooked viands found ready sale. 
A social good time was enjoyed by those congregated together. The host, Mr. Whitney, contributed graphophone selections. Between $13 and $14 were realized. The committee in charge was Mrs. Frank C. Hildreth, Mrs. John McMaster, Mrs. Ida M. Gould, and Mrs. Isles. The next section is called Boys' Supper. In line with anniversaries and suppers, that enterprising club, the Knights of King Arthur, are right in with the procession. Under the friendly direction of their capable leader, Reverend Charles P. Marshall, they had a supper, initiation, and entertainment Wednesday evening at the Congregational Vestry. The boys managed all the details of the supper, getting the food together, setting tables, making cocoa, etc., and if there were any culinary defects, we only say if, they were easily overlooked with the zest of keen boyish appetites and the atmosphere of prevailing good cheer. This event marks the anniversary of the formation of the first society of this name. Previous to the supper, one new member went through the ceremony of initiation, and after it, an informal entertainment was enjoyed. The only invited guests were several older boys who had previously belonged, making about 25 in all. The committee for this event was Seth, was Seth Bannister, Alistair McDougall, John Feeney, and Albert Day. This uh, Knights of King Arthur was an early uh, boy, what we would call Boy Scouts now. It's, it wasn't part of the Boy Scout, the official Boy Scout program, which was starting up about this same time period, but it was a similar organization. The next section is the About Town section. Frank D. McGlinchey, who was seriously injured last week and removed to St. John's Hospital Lowell, is apparently out of danger. Owing to misinformation, the place where the accident occurred was incorrectly reported. While working, clearing away the debris of the recently burned mill of George C. Moore at North Chelmsford, he was struck on the back of the head with an iron beam, which caused unconsciousness to assert itself. It looks like the... Fu- it- looked like the final controlling element for a while, but a rugged constitution and modern hospital treatment have caused consciousness to resume the normal relations of life. J. Henry Henry Decatur, who was injured last week at the ice houses at Forge Pond by the breaking of a chain which struck him with full force and persuasion in the back so that he, with the assistance of two friends, was removed to Lowell, is reported as doing finely, although, of course, it is inconvenient to do finely in this roundabout way. The proceeds from the food sale of Mrs. E.J. Whitney's on Tuesday under the auspices of the WCTU, Women's Christian Temperance Union, will be devoted to buying flowers for the sick and other expenses of the association. At the same place this Saturday evening, the same organization will hold a sociable. All members and honorary members and others of honor without honorary are invited to join in the course of a three-minute round of remarking their whereabouts on the the Let Drink Alone. Uh, That's a new bylaw in town. This will be not Tower of Babel recitation, but one at a time. The never-to-be-discouraged and ever-good-natured Joe Wall is preparing to come, and this sense, come means uh, perform. It's it's used that way 100 years ago, but we don't use it that way anymore. Joe Wall is preparing to come one of his uh, annual humorous amateur plays that always keeps society busy with laughing while he is photographing his character characters on the stage. On Wednesday, February 17th, Middlesex Worcester Pomona Pomona Grange will hold a meeting at Groton with an especially interesting program for discussion, including an address in the afternoon by John H. Bonner of Leicester, England. Subject, Are There Perils in Vaccination? As he is to speak against vaccination, nothing but the Farmers Institute on the same date prevents some troublesome questions to answer being asked in a sort of cross-examination of his anti-vaccination opinions. Uh, You can bet that that Sam Taylor would be there, except he's probably going to the Farmers Institute. The Enterprise Club 
held another of its wholesome rallies at the Unitarian Church on Sunday evening in memory of Lincoln. Miss Effie Bennett led the meeting and read a grand and beautiful story of his life. Miss Gertrude Hamlin read his favorite poem, and selections on his life were read by John Feeney Jr. and Miss Ruth Miller. Reverend B. H. Bailey, with his usual storehouse of reminiscence, related his personal experience in Washington at the time of the assassination of Lincoln. This personal testimony by one, quote, who knows whereof he speaks and testifies that he has seen, end quote, has a value of it as bearing upon the life of Lincoln and the environments of the times that no library is able to catalog. The eyewitness of history is never in the library, at best only a statue and that largely a shadow of, quote, once was eyewitness, end quote. The previous paragraph mentions Lincoln's favorite poem. It was a poem called Morality or Oh, Why Should the Spirit or Mortal Be Proud by the Scotsman William Knox, who was born in 1789 and died in 1825. Uh, Lincoln saw it in a newspaper during the summer of 1845 and uh, cut it out and I believe memorized it. It has 14 verses and I'll just read the first one for you. Oh, why should the spirit of mortal be proud? Like a swift fleeting meteor, a fast flying cloud, a flash of lightning, a break of the wave, he passes from life to his rest in the grave. And it goes on for 13 more verses in a similar tone. The next uh, section is called Annual Dinner. The old saying, all's well that ends well, can be improved on and was, impro- and was improved on by the town officers at the annual town farm dinner last Saturday. Here it could be unanim- unanimously said that all's well that begins well, for there was a splendid beginning and a tremendous ending, with universal regrets at physical inability to continue their appetites another crumb. Such were the temptations of the good things spread out that when the physical was unable to proceed further, it was aided by a resort to overcoat pockets. That is to say, if they couldn't eat it, they put it in their pockets to take home and eat later. The dinner was one of Boynton's old timers. Uh, Boynton's, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Boynton ran the Town Farm, uh, located on Town Farm Road, and this was their annual dinner for the overseers and other town officers. The dinner was one of the Boynton's old-timers, and so were the town officers' old-timers at this business, and they saw at a glance what they were up against and went for it. But it was too much for them, hence how thoughtful to have large overcoats with large pockets. Among those present were Edward Fisher, Oscar R. Spaulding, Edward M. Abbott, Selectman, J. Willard Fletcher, Charles D. Colburn, Samuel L. Taylor, Assessors, Charles L. Hildreth, A. H. Burnham, Albert R. Schote, Overseers of the Poor. The appraisers of property, not including the dinner, were H. L. Hildreth, George A. Kimball, and John A. Healy. The collector of taxes, Leonard W. Wheeler, was also present to see that so much was not eaten as to raise the tax rate and thus make the burden of eating coincide with the burden of tax collecting. Last came the auditor, William R. Taylor, Sam, Sam's son, to make everyone face an account of their doings. Everyone appealed. The appeal will be heard at the same place next year. Of the company who sat down to dinner, only one used tobacco. So that town, so that town clerk Edward Fisher, who has been notifying the public that it was a girl, escaped passing around those cigars for lack of patronage. But congratulations as ever. The next section is the Graniteville section. Bert Derone, uh, that's spelled capital D E capital R O E H N. The well-known baseball player is now in Pinehurst, North Carolina, and the Pinehurst Outlook, published in that place, has the following to say about him. Bert Derone, one of the best players of last year's nine, will captain the Carolina team, alternating in catching and the field with Harry Norris. During the summer, Derone caught on the Hamilton, Ontario National League team 
and Norris put in his second season with the New England League in the same capacity playing with Fall River. It appears from the above that Burt is in fast company for other well-known ball players, including Mike Lynch of the Philadelphia Americans. That was a, a uh, American League major league team who will play infield. Harry Snell and others are associated with him. The late, as far as I know, Burt Deron never played in the major leagues, but he, he clearly played in the minors. The Ladies' Aid Society of the Methodist Church met with Mrs. Lucy A. Blood at, she lived at 28 Broadway Street in Graniteville, on Thursday evening. Reverend Samuel H. Armand of the Method, Methodist Church visited in Fitchburg last Sunday, and during his absence, the morning and evening services at the church that the Methodist Church in Graniteville were conducted by Mrs. Armand. Uh, her maiden name was Bertha King, and she actually met her husband while they were both attending the Boston University School of Theology. Sadly, uh, Reverend Samuel Armand died in 1913 while serving as a missionary in the Philippines. And Mrs. Armand then married Samuel's twin brother, Reverend Jesse Armand, uh, another uh, Methodist minister who was at the Boston School of Theology at the same time. The supper and entertainment given by the Men's Club of the Methodist Church, and which has been looked forward to with such deep interest by the village people, came off on schedule time last week, Friday evening, and was very largely attended. There were many present from Lowell, West Chelmsford, Westford, and Forge, not forgetting William White of Texas, who was visiting relatives here. The supper, as predicted, was under the entire charge of the men who were neatly dressed in white coats, dark trousers, and each wearing a pink carnation. They didn't need any flowers, however, for, quote, bouquets, end quote, were continually heaped upon them for the fine supper that had been provided and the excellent service given by the men in charge of the tables. Frank Conter, as head waiter, kept things running as smoothly as well-oiled machinery, and from start to finish, there was not a hitch. Right here, let it be said that there was one man, although he was not seen much, whose good work was very much in evidence, and to John B. Carmichael, much credit is due for his knowledge and foresight in planning for the welfare of all and for the hard work he has put into this affair from the very start. As for the supper, it was all that could possibly be desired. Fred Smith was the cook, and he prepared an excellent menu consisting of oysters cooked in all ways, coffee, rolls, pies, and cakes of all kinds, as well as side dishes that were very tempting. Not all of the cooking was done by him, however, for there were certain delicacies that had a familiar flavor, and it must be confessed that several women had a finger in the pie. So, in spite of the great success that the men made of the supper, they will have to admit that they couldn't get along very well without the ladies. During the supper, when the tables had to be set three times to accommodate the large number in attendance, excellent phonograph music was given by Lester McClenna, after which a pleasing entertainment was given. The committee in charge of the entertainment is to be commended in securing John A. Taylor, reader, as special attraction. Mr. Taylor is an elocutionist of rare charm, and being endowed with a pleasing personality and a fine stage presence, he made a decided hit. His readings on Friday evening consisted of selections from Burdett, Riley, Eugene Field, and Sam Walter Foss. And although all were given with just the right dramatic force, Riley's ever popular old sweetheart of mine and fields in the twilight proved the most pleasing. Of course, this is the same John A. Taylor that we uh, read about in last week's um, podcast who had recently get, uh, graduated from the Emerson School uh, where he trained in elocution. The next section is called Installation. At a special meeting of Court Westford MCOF, that's the Massachusetts Catholic Order of Forestries, in Healy's Hall last Sunday evening, it was fully decided that all the newly elected officers of the court will be duly installed at a public installation to be held in the town hall, North Chelmsford, on Sunday, February 14th at 2 o'clock. 
The degree staff from Court Merrimack of Haverhill will perform the degree work, as this staff is composed of over 30 young women whose floor work is considered the best in this section of the state. It would be utterly impossible for them to perform the different evolutions at the regular meeting place of the court here, and for that reason, the place for this important event was changed to the town hall at North Chelmsford. The next section is uh, a brief section on Forge Village. The ladies' sewing circle gave their annual supper to the vestrymen of St. Andrew's Mission on Wednesday evening. There were quite a goodly number present, notwithstanding the stormy weather. weather. Reverend Thomas L. Fisher was unable to be present owing to sickness, but with his usual thoughtfulness, sent flowers to make the tables look attractive. The supper was a success both socially and financially. A piano, a piano for the Cameron School has been purchased with the funds obtained by the pupils. And that's the news in Westford for the week ending February 13th, 1909. Thank you for listening, and thanks to Nick Woodbury of Westford Cat for providing technical support. You can find transcriptions and podcasts from the wardsmen at our w- website at museum.westford.org or visit the Historical Society's Facebook page for more Westford news from a century ago. This is Bob Oliphant, and I hope you will join us for, the next, for next week's Westford Wardsman podcast. Thank you.